be here. So many introductions. Um, I hope that I meet your expectations. Setting the pedestal or uh, the uh, marker really high. So uh, I like to start off before the lecture by saying um, it's people say how do you do it all and how do you juggle and balance everything and the earnest and authentic answer is I don't. Um, it's a constant struggle for me still, and it'll come out in the story, but my mantra is this, fail fast, fail often, let failure be your fuel, uh, not fear. You can fail in the moment and not be a, a failure in life. So with that being said, the story is not about just triumphs, and, uh, but traveling through difficulty and challenges, and in spite of that, coming out with persistence, as was said before. So um, before I launch into the odyssey that will be the diatribe of why it really matters, I ask this question of the audience, very interactive part of the conversation. Um, if asked by anybody, a stranger, if you could tell them the difference between equality and equity, how many of you would feel comfortable telling people the difference between the two today? Okay. Yes, I still have challenges trying to describe that to people, but this meme helps out very explicitly on what the differences are and why there is a need to explain the difference. On the left, you see equality, which essentially means everybody gets the same exact resource to solve a challenge or a barrier, regardless of the outcome. In this case, representation of a short versus tall person looking over the fence at, say, the World Series. So regardless of the same exact resource, the shortest person still can't see over the barrier, in this case, the fence. With equity as a mindset, the idea is to identify and minimize the barriers to success to maximize our collective potential. And in this case, the tall person in this particular situation doesn't need their resource, strength in numbers, they give it to the short person, win-win, everybody gets to see the World Series. And I have people ask me, well, what if I'm always the short, a tall person giving my resources to the short person? Is that fair? Is that just? Um, the reality is ever increasingly so in our society at large that our likelihood of becoming the short person is ever so increasing. We see that on a daily basis throughout the year, whether it's through natural disaster, forest fires, um, mass shootings, whether it's a government shutdown where people who are living paycheck by paycheck are at wit's end whether or not they're going to meet their mortgage payments, whether or not they could pay for a child who's born with uh, birth defects in a hospital situation, right? So if we live by that mindset, that kind of sets us up for what we need to do to change how we behave. If we are to survive as a society at large, we need to adopt an equitable mindset and equitable framework. Um, this also comes into the question of architecture. How many of you have seen the um, video with I Love Lucy? This is an old skit. Um, some of the younger generation might need to look this up on YouTube. <laughs> but it's a hilarious skit, and it's very teaching of the things that we need to address in architecture. So Lucy and Ethel are housewives. They want to get a job, and their husbands laugh at them, but they insist that they're going to do it. They go to a chocolate factory, and throughout the day, they've kind of done these tasks and they've failed and this is their last chance to prove themselves. So all they have to do is wrap the chocolates and put them back on the conveyor belt. Simple task, right? Well, they're doing great and all of a sudden the conveyor belt speeds up and they're trying to keep up uh, with putting the chocolates into their shirts, into their mouths, into their hats, just so that they can look like they're keeping up with the conveyor belt. Well, guess what their reward is? The supervisor comes into the room, sees, sees that they're doing a great job and says, Speed her up, ladies! <laughs> so guess what? The conveyor belt keeps going faster and faster, and you're never winning. How many of you in the room feel like you're just keeping up? You're just getting by. You're hiding those chocolates in your mouth. <laughs> so that's why we need to talk about equity in architecture. And then how does it matter for those of you who aren't architects? Why does it mean anything to you in our communities? And what does architecture have to do with that connection of equity? So at its best, when we don't care about the intention of our designs, when we're not mindful of equitable outcomes, um, we get benign spaces. You know, they're underwhelming. They don't serve the maximum purpose that they can. 
at the worst, um, they have the ability to harm people, whether it's in prisons or um, Walmart, you know, the Walmart buildings that aren't intended to be used for housing and containing people that are in a long, you know, living uh, circumstance. So we need to be mindful of those things and how design could potentially perpetuate injustice and harm people uh, if we're not intentional about it. So deep thoughts. I'm going to switch gears a little bit into talking about what inspired you to become an architect. So think about the first time you thought and were excited and committed about saying, I wanted to study architecture, I want to become an architect. And that moment for me happened when I was 11 years old with my red pants. <laughs> Not much has changed. Um, but I grew up in suburban New Jersey thinking that architecture was malls and suburban track homes. And that was architecture to me until I went to go visit my grandparents in China and I realized that architecture was much, much more. Great Wall of the Forbidden City, the little alleys, the quintessential courtyards of Hutong um, that were the networks, the neighborhood fabric of the society. And my grandfather said something that was really compelling to me in Chinese. He said that architecture wasn't about just the building or the individual people. It was actually meant to be a time capsule to uh, capture the civilization, um, what they're doing, the culture of the place. And that was profound impact to me. I didn't realize it at the time, but that was the trigger for me wanting to study architecture, to have this level of profound impact on society at large. So I went to Syracuse University, studied architecture, studied uh, the great architects of the time. There weren't that many women represented, but a lot of um, European architecture, not that much about other cultures and places, and I thought that's what architecture was. I graduated in the heart of a recession in 1994, and troubled by the fact that I wouldn't get a job, contemplated whether or not I was going to continue on with architecture as a career choice. Luckily for me, a uh, fellow student at the time was working at Bowen Swinsky Jackson, and she said, you, should, you need to apply. We're doing projects out west, and for a company doing digital animation, at that time it was this weird thing, brand new, uh, instead of you know animating by hand, but this is a company called Pixar Animation Studios. <laughs> so we're working out of Pittsburgh and going to California. You should apply. So I applied. I got the job with Lowell Swinsky Jackson. And uh, we worked on Pixar Animation Studios in Emeryville, California. But we were flying back and forth between Pix Pittsburgh and California. And the client took us aside one day. They said, we're sorry, but the project's not going fast enough. Uh, we need solutions on how to get back on schedule. Can anybody make any suggestions? And at that point, they took us out for drinks and dinner, and I got brave and brazen enough to uh, shout out the stupid answer, which was, you can move us out to California. That would solve this schedule challenge, with all my colleagues mortified and laughing at me and saying that they would never do that. Why would you say such a thing? Well, a few weeks later, guess what? They moved us out to California. <laughs> So the lesson there was never be afraid to shout out the stupid answer or ask the stupid question because you never know what might happen. So that started the uh, San Francisco office of Bolin Swinsky Jackson back in 1999. And we did end up finishing the project on time, on schedule, on budget. And it started this relationship with Steve Jobs who was curious about all of us um, young folks who came out to California with this very um, up, um, open mindset about what we could and couldn't do. So that started off in a transition to when he went back to Apple and he had this envisioned idea of revamping the company but also getting into retail at the time that Apple was still about 2% of the market share. And again, people laughed at him to say, you've got to be crazy. Nobody knows about your products. Microsoft is king. and." Who knows about retail stores that just sell all computer products? Who's going to go to those types of stores? Well, he challenged us to defy disbelief, suspend. It was a reality distortion field. It was suspending disbelief long enough to believe in these crazy ideas. And including that was a all glass staircase that, was, that had no steel structural supports. And it couldn't be done at the time. Everybody, again, was in disbelief. But he challenged us. And we pushed and pushed, and we came up with the first glass staircase at the Apple Solo store. So again, suspending disbelief, challenging when people say, no, it's impossible, it can't be done, to say, yes, it can, and, and persist until you get to the outcome. So we have a patent on that project 
And at the same time, I met my husband while we were finishing this project. So we happened to have a photo at the store <laughs> because Steve insisted um, that we have that we have a. He said we should get married in the store. We didn't want to, but we said we would put our photos taken. So there was a pretty uh, opportunity there. And then finally, um, a story about. Um, champions. So the last project I did for Apple was the Glass Cube at Gia Plaza in New York City. And at that time I um, was doing that project, I became pregnant with my first child. So simultaneously designing, negotiating with the landlord, and doing uh, CD drawings. And I didn't think of anything was wrong with uh, the profession. You know, you hear things about sexism and things not being right, and I never felt that until uh, the point I walked into a meeting with this landlord, Harry Backlow, uh, six months pregnant, and he looked at me and he said, oh, interesting. So, which one of you in this room is responsible for this? All men in the room. And it was this mortifying moment of, aha, of their sexism staring me at the face. And um, I had a great comeback, though. I said, why, Harry, I'm going to name the kid after you, Backlow. Isn't that great? And he was mortified. And he said, no, don't do that. That would be an awful thing to do. <laughs> so the building got built. Uh, I birthed my first child. And I was invited back to the store. And I was elated that we had been invited back. And I thought that was it. You know, this is the best thing in the world. And at the time, I was committed to raising my daughter. I uh, basically declined from doing any future projects. And Steve said that was too bad. But why don't you come down out to dinner with us? to celebrate the opening of the queue, but I'm sorry you can't bring your family, you only have one spot for you and nobody else. And at the time I was breastfeeding and I didn't want to tell him that I was sort of embarrassed, so I declined dinner with Steve Jobs. And in the back of my mind I was thinking, stupid, stupid chance of a lifetime, who gives up dinner with Steve Jobs? Me. Um, and I thought that was it. But then later in the day, he came back up to me. This was the day of the opening of the store. And he said, OK, you can bring your husband, but there's no kids coming tonight. Can you get a babysitter in New York last minute? <laughs> and respectfully, I declined again because I could not leave my daughter, didn't have a babysitter. And I thought, two times, really, really stupid. Not going to happen again. But at the end of the day, something really amazing happened. Uh, it was See, the store was packed, and then he came through the crowd, like part, Moses parting the Red Sea. And he says this to me, OK, you drive a hard bargain. The kid could come. But <laughs> she poops, she, is, she cries, she's out. <laughs> wow, what an invitation, right? <laughs> well, that means to report that Jordan is 13 years old today. She survived dinner. <laughs> she had no fear, right? And she was the best guest ever. And afterwards, Stephen said, she's Jordan's really cool. She can come out to dinner with us anytime. <laughs> Little did we know that he had cancer. And unfortunately, that was the last time we had seen Steve. Uh, but the lesson learned from this story is that we need champions um, to remind us of our value when we don't have our own faith or confidence in ourselves. Um, to ask us to the table one, two, three times, um, and to insist that we're there, that we're included. And not that we need champions, but also that we need to be champions. We need to pay it forward to the next generation and be there for those that can't um, see their own value currently, but we see the potential in them. And that story carries along to the next project that I worked on, which was an all-women's college in Oakland, California, the Lori I. Loki Graduate School of Business, which was built under the premise that there are a lack of women in the C-suite. And um, there was a lot of donors and commitment from this women's college to set forth and educate the next level of CEOs for our nation. And it wasn't just a building about um, paying it forward for women, but it was about social responsibility as well. So this project was a project with not just women as leaders of um, the client side, but also on the design team side. Myself as project manager, project architect, there were project engineers, structural engineers, all women leading those charges, and they made sure of that, including the superintendent was a woman superintendent. Wow, what a utopian project opportunity. Um, as an outcome, it is still thriving today on its mission of social responsibility. And again, it just touted that when there's a vision of commitment and everybody doubles, doubles down and supports that commitment, that good things happen. 
and they continue to thrive. So at the end of that was 2009. I don't know how many of you remember 2009 as the beginning of the Great Recession, and a lot of firms were laying off the time, including ours. And at that time, I had my second child, and it was the end of this project, and I thought I was in great risk of being laid off. And I also felt like a failure of not being a good parent with two children and grappling with <coughs> doing both architecture and being a parent successfully. So I con contemplated leaving architecture at that time. And a lot of people said, no, don't leave. You have a lot to invest in architecture, and you've done a lot. Please don't leave, do something. You know, and thank God for that, because this Lin-Manuel Miranda quote kind of basically sums it up. We all grapple with paradox that tomorrow is not promised, but we make plans anyway. So with that in mind and the faith of the people that were mentoring me, I didn't quit. Um, I set about doing some fact-finding and soul-searching of what I should be doing to, again, reclaim that energy and the desire I had to become an architect in the first place. Where was I seeking to make profound impact? And there are some lights and beacons at that time um, during this discovery for me, whether it was Carolyn James and Ariel Lasson Lichten at Harvard, GSD, Women in Architecture, who were petitioning for Denise Scott Brown to be recognized with her husband for the Pritzker Prize, whether it was Despina Stratagakos and Kelly Hayes McElhoney, who convinced Mattel to market Architect Barbie as a reason why girls would want to consider architecture as a career. And then also um, architects, architects with two X's and uh, Parlor combined, Justine Clark and Lori Brown, recognizing the lack of recognition for women in Wikipedia and the dire need for that recognition and creating Wicked as a grant through um, Wikipedia to um, increase the number of women written into uh, memory and history, if you will. Okay, so with all that information, we saw that there was a lack of research and data about the challenges that were affecting why women were leaving the profession of architecture. As you have heard about the missing 32%, about 50, 50 uh, women and men graduate from architecture school, but only 18% become licensed architects of women in the profession. That information of itself was the only information we could find. There wasn't really any data on the why that was happening. So we had committed in our energy to do the research to get there, but we had never done a research study before. So at that time we committed, we felt like we had committed to eating a whale. How many of you have heard the Shel Silverstein poem about Melinda May, this little girl who claimed she was gonna eat this giant whale? So it took her, 89 years to eat that whale. She did it bite for bite, little chewing at a time. But who wants to wait 89 years for equity to happen in our profession and in our society at large? I, I'm sure I don't, and I'm sure most of you don't either. So what's the solution? Well, rather than one person eating their own whale, why don't we all gather together and eat our collective whale with bigger forks and um, empowered with information. So at the same moment, I was reading a lot of articles that energized me. Alexandra Lang wrote, Lowe Fellow wrote for Metropolis Magazine, this architecture's lean in moment statement that was my calling card. We need to create a new set of best practices that will be a design project in and of itself based on data, shared examples and interpretation once written. We need to find leaders who will adopt them firm by firm, sector by sector. So we went about looking at information that would frame our study, our first research study. As you can see here, women employed in all occupations, 2011, architecture, architects being on the low end at 13.6% compared to other professions, as you can see. And when we look at architecture and AEC professions, architects actually are on the high end of representation, even though we're still low, but when you see civil engineers, engineers in general, and contractors, the numbers get even lower. So the AEC has a lot of work to do as far as representation is concerned. And then when we look at architects, we see the trend of attrition happening. And that kind of informed our research study on the practicality of the why. So in 2014, we launched into our first study around this premise of the life of an architect, the career pinch points. Uh, from the time that you graduate, from architecture school to the time that you retire, what are the possible pinch points of the factors that cause you to leave architecture as a career? Whether it was hiring, whether it was the time between hiring and licensure, paying your dues, the challenge of licensure, the difficulty of getting licensed, 
which now and at that point extended into 12, um, 12 years before the average person got licensed, which was way too long. What we called working parents at the time, which is now transformed into caregiving, and then glass ceiling, which was about implicit bias. In 2016, you could see that the complexity of information that we had built upon the foundation of those pinch points into career dynamics. So an intersection of things that could happen to you, not just at isolated points within your career, but also at multiple points, whether it was finding the right fit, work-life integration, professional development, pay equity, or having careers beyond architecture and feeling and identifying that you were still an architect. So in 2018, we had done the third survey with a more complex range of factors. And as you can see here, it's a little hard to read, but each shade of the color represents a different group, an identity, whether it was uh, male or female in gender, or race and ethnicity. We also sampled for non-binary gender, but there are too few of them to be represented in this uh, particular map. We're going to be doing a very specialized study for those that identify as non-binary genders, but again, those numbers were so few that they would not be accurately represented on this current map. 14,360 people took the last survey. We have done from the 20, 2014 survey, which was just 2,000. And as you can see, we actually had uh, more males than females take the survey this particular year while still oversampling for women because we know that women are only approximately 20% of those represented. As you can see, we did have people represented as non-binary, but the proportions were so extreme that we couldn't show them in this current study of the early findings. We see when we look at race and ethnicity, that there is a lack of representation that is parallel with what we see in AIA research findings. And we also see that um, most people identify as heterosexual with a smaller grouping of those that identify as other. In our age representation, we see that we have younger generation that is more diverse. And then typically our older generation of respondents are less diverse. We see that um, when we look at the intersection, the majority of our population is still white and male in the profession. And then when we look at um, statistics indicative of college students, so this will be very important to you all, is that the first generation college student um, is the greatest challenge right now of getting representation. There are more that are of different race and ethnicities but the biggest challenge is um, what are the, identifying the barriers uh, to graduation that we may not see directly based on one's background. And when we look at the average, one of those factors is debt. So we know with the decrease of funding by the government for student loans and also programs at universities, that there's greater debt incurred by those um, from most recent graduation years. The difference between MRCs and BRCs is um, staggering in that the greatest debt is acquired, the difference being between twenty dollars to $40,000 between those that have recently graduated from architecture school. And then, as you can see, the other inverse of that is the salaries that one makes when you come out of school. There really isn't much difference between the BRC and MRCs, even though we're seeing a high incurrence of debt for those that are taking the MRC degree risk. And when we look at race and ethnicity and gender across the board, the me while the median debt is the dash burgundy line, we see that the greatest debt incurred are those that identify as black male and female architects, staggering at the $100,000 range. And we know that in terms of salary, they tend to make the least, we'll show that later in the, in the pay equity um, slides. And when we transition into early career perceptions versus late career perceptions, those that are immediate graduates of architecture school, we see that there is more positive outlooks in early career based on workload and work life, but more negative career outlooks based on meaningful work, the impact of the work that those um, early career perceptions are having, their general energy and their likelihood of retention in their current job or in architecture. 
we see that the top retention predictors are these. Those that are less likely to stay in architecture have no uh, current training in their firms for other roles or advancement, and they have no friends at work. Those that are more likely to stay at their current positions find that their work impacts their community, they're building relationships at the firm, and they receive one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is very important for retention. When we look at um, transition into those that are providing care, we see that more men are likely to be parents than their female counterparts across the entire spectrum of the years of experience within the respondent pool. When we looked at the information for um, caregiving responsibility, we see that more women identified as the primary caregiver or a single parent in a situation with more men um, as those that were sharing the child care responsibilities with their partners. We see this outcome parallel to other studies done by Harvard um, in terms of what is dubbed the daddy bonus and mother penalty, meaning that males um, that are the primary, care, sorry, males that are the um, secondary caregivers but are parents are rewarded the highest salaries, while women who are the primary caregivers are rewarded the least salary compared to their counterparts. We believe that that stigma is beyond architecture in terms of who is expected to be the primary versus the secondary caregiver in our society at large. How do we mitigate that with our policies and our procedures, we could talk about that in a little bit. So in terms of glass ceiling, um, there's two ways to parse this out. One is by race and ethnicity, the other is by gender. When we look at race and ethnicity, uh, most people who responded identified that they worked at firms that were mostly white or all white. While when we look at um, gender, we see that most people identified at, that they worked at firms that were mostly male although the second was that they're equal versus all male, but we still have a problem with the mostly male perception. When we look at likelihood of aspiring aspirations to lead a firm in the future, we see that inadvertently white males have higher aspirations than their non-white female or um, women of color counterparts to have those aspirations and goals. When we look at the respondents' likelihood of becoming a principal or partner in their, based on their years of experience, again, we see that um, those that are white are more likely to become leaders or principals in their firms versus their counterparts of color. And then when we look at the promotion criteria by their current position, we see that those that identify as principals rate their promotion criteria by project outcome, then client relationships then project wins, et cetera. But then we see that all staff, the predominance, do not know what the promotion criteria are in the firm. So quite troubling is the disconnect between what principals view as clear promotion criteria versus what the rest of the staff perceive as not knowing what the criteria, promotion, promotion criteria is. We have a lot to do in terms of that transparency and explicit policy writing and advancement. <coughs> When we transition to personal value systems, this is an interesting study in looking at this uh, personal value web. So on one side of the spectrum, there is the characteristics of personal focus, self-growth, and expansion. On the other side, we see self-protection, anxiety, avoidance, and social focus. So the interesting thing is that all respondents tended to be on one half of the spectrum. We want to be architects because we find it stimulating in solving complex, challenging problems. And we have curiosity and creativity, and we believe we have freedom to do so. Those were the highest marks. We also want it to be helpful and have impact on society and have a sense of purpose and enjoyment while we are doing these things, rather than the other perceptions of social power, authority, wealth, acquisition, or um, conformity, uh, Etc. The interesting thing is when you look at that information, and this is a little more nuanced, and you can hear about the nuances in our video that we'll have out um, really soon, but this is a little more complex, and I rely on my research chairs to define these a little bit more succinctly. But when you look at the assertion of those personal value systems to the values that people perceive are their key values in their firms, 
the top rated values for those firms were actually different from those personal values. So client satisfaction, profitability and growth, and collaboration and teamwork outpaced those qualities of meaningful work, joy, and the social impact part of it. So how can we bridge that disconnect? We know we have to do all these things, but there seems to be a very uh, disproportionate uh, disconnect between client satisfaction and then the personal goals that people choose architecture in the first place. Finding the right fit. So those that were, um, most of the people that responded to the survey work, currently work at firms. There are a few sole practitioners and also those that went beyond architecture. We also see that those that work in another field tend to be in higher education or training, as well as construction related real estate engineering professions concurrently. Top reasons for people taking um, jobs in architecture by gender were the project quality, the workplace culture of the firm, and the opportunities for learning and professional development. When we look at the top prevention, sorry, retention predictors by respondent gender, we see that those that believe that their work positively impacts clients and one-on-one -on -one coaching had extreme benefits to those that did not feel that they had recognition for their contributions, their work, they did not believe that their work had impact and they didn't know what the firm's values were. So very negative in terms of likelihood of retention. Finally, pay equity, which is probably the most interesting one, is that there is a pay disparity across the board between men and women that we've noted throughout 2014, 2016, and 2018. In the 2016 and 2018 surveys, we still see that there's a disparity between design principles. So the creativity bias. Concurrently, there is a uh, study that was done by Duke University, Fuqua School of Business, on creativity bias that simulated an architecture portfolio and asked men and women to judge the architecture portfolio by the creativity. And they told one group that it was a male and the other group that it was a female. Same exact uh, portfolio drawings, etc. They just changed the names. So both men and women rated the male portfolio as being more creative than the women's portfolio. This is compounded by uh, technology and the bias of schools and what we teach the next generation. Who are the famous architects, the ones that are deemed worthy of great design? Who, are, who is rewarded? Who is given the recognition? When we do a simple Google search, we find when you type in famous architect, you get the usual suspects, the star architects, right? Oh, and then we see Zaha Hadid, which is great, but this is kind of compounding the situation. So thankfully, we have a lot of campaigns now, whether it's Madam Architect, the podcast, or it's Wicked for Wikipedia to raise the recognition of the work that women do as collaborators, but as also as sole practitioners and the design creative in any project situation, that there's a dire need to shift the recognition um, in balance that currently exists. As far as average salary, we see the median versus the extremes of those who make the most, and no surprise that it is the um, white males in respondent pool versus the extreme of the African American or black women who are making the least. And that compounds with that debt incurrence that you saw earlier on. The average debt was in the $100,000 range, and yet they are making the least. And of the later, they're doing better earlier on, but as you can see with the later respondents, that there's still a pay disparity between the two. Um, in terms of those that are rewarded when asked, do you build relationships with potential clients? Those that answered yes, are in the darker colors and those that did not are in the lighter colors. We see that even though men and women ask, uh, are rewarded for building relationships with clients, that those in the later years have a disproportionate amount of reward for the same activity. <laughs> Shifting gears, deep thoughts. Bias interrupters, how do we solve for these biases that we just highlighted? Um, you can't read this very well, Let me try to Zoom in a little bit, just as an example. So these are some of the things we're trying to do in uh, large firms in general in mitigating bias practices, and we've been talking about this at the Large Firm Roundtable, which is in the hiring practice, 
how do you level the playing field, whether it's blind resumes when they're applying so that you level the playing field there. We know that there's bias about names, not only male, female, but also those that are eth more ethnic sounding than those that are more anglicized. We know that uh, with the hiring process, unless you have a rubric of criteria, which equally looks at all criteria the same, meaning that you ask all the applicants all the applicants the same exact questions, both on their past performance and their potential, that you're going to get, again, skewed bias that way. So that's just an example. That also relates to promotion criteria and the level of mentoring and coaching, but as well as more tactical approaches such as pay audits that need to happen not just once, but on a biannual or annual basis. Because uh, especially with larger companies, but with new employees as well, um, every time you do a pay audit, it doesn't mean that you're good forever and ever, but when large companies acquire new companies, they inherit the bias of the acquired company, but also when new people come in at different times of the economy, there tends to be a, a re-skewing of the bias that happens. Um, in terms of employer-driven equitable practices, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see some of the examples we've asked. What is your firm currently doing to mitigate uh, these biases or inequitable practices? A lot of people answer, the top answer was hires those from diverse backgrounds. So while that is an immediate solution, it doesn't um, necessarily give you kind of a, a free hall pass at establishing equitable frameworks and policies and procedures because that could be a revolving door thing where yes, we're hiring people of diverse backgrounds, but if you don't change the culture of the place for promotion, for mentoring, et cetera, pay equity, they're going to leave just as quickly as they came in the door. We also see uh, mentorship, discussing equity with employees, all the way down to actively mitigating bias and policies and practices, and providing training and resources for cultural empathy and cultural competence. All these things are important, and it's not just the one thing, but the ingredients requires an intentionality of multiple tactics. So finally, metrics of success. I know this is a lot of information, thank you for bearing with me. Um, what are the three major metrics of success that are the recipe for career retention in the practice of architecture? Culture and relationships. So all these factors have to do with perceived justice, um, whether people feel that they're being treated fairly, whether they feel that there's just and equitable practices across the board, engagement and impact, whether or not they're developing relationships, whether they're feeling that their projects are meaningful and rewarding and impactful, and that they're involved in the decision-making process. And then finally, work-life, whether they believe that they have enough time to perceive other activities, that they don't have challenges, be struggles between their personal and professional lives. Specifically to work-life, we see that those who have a, a positive work perception of work life, work um, 10 hours or fewer, um, fewer times a year or less. So they don't have overworked schedules. Their firm values employee growth, their firm values culture and relationships, personal schedules influence pr project schedules. So everybody's talking together about what the ideal project schedule is. And there's use of benefits such as uh, personal leave without negative impacts to promotion. We see that the negative impacts of those uh, who feel that they don't have work-life balance or integration as having personal uh, and professional conflicts, they are turning down project opportunities, they're falling short on personal responsibilities, they're having poor physical or emotional health, and they do work more than 10 plus hours more than once a week. When asked, where do you take the personal and professional hit? Uh, when given that challenge. Most people take it on the personal side of their lives, most respondents answer, versus taking it on the professional side. That includes um, poor physical and mental health, which is a huge problem, falling short on their responsibilities and conflicts with their personal relationships. How do employees encourage work life? Um, autonomy in the day-to-day -day schedule. So they're not measured by the butts and seeds, whether they're physically seen as looking busy, but they're actually measured on their work outcomes. And that we've seen in our office as having a huge impact when people are given, given the leverage to do the work 
when they do the work most productively, whether it's having core hours, 10 to 4, everybody agrees to have meetings, and then 8 to 10, and 4 to 6, et cetera, is heads down time. So there, there is an agreement of giving flexibility to those that need it, not just for caregiving, but for appointments, um, heads down work, what have you. Work-life policies that are available to all. So it's not just a special group of people that receive work-life policies, but making sure that those frameworks are um, accessible to everyone. Benefit use doesn't impact promotion. Again, it's, the policy isn't good if you can't use it and you can't leverage it. Yes, there's a policy, but if the leadership doesn't take the time off or if they don't practice it, you're not going to get the full benefit of those resources. Finally, culture and relationships. Um, the perceived organizational justice has a huge impact on whether or not people stay with their current firm or they go to another firm. So within that, there's interpersonal justice, whether you're, you feel like you're being treated fairly, justice for all, the perception that all workers are being treated fairly within a system of policies and procedures, procedural justice in the process of, of your work compensation, etc., informational justice, again, communications, who's getting the information, who's being asked to go to meetings, and distributive justice, which represents um, resources, whether it's bonuses or access to different policies and procedures. Uh, positive and negative culture and relationships of those perceptions. So we see that those that have a positive view um, believe that there's cultural competence um, being assessed and um, taught to their peers and their yeah at a firm level. Firm values and cultural. The firm values cultural relationships. The firm leaders call out bias when they see it. They use benefits that don't impact promotion, and firm leaders mitigate bias in their policies. Are you comfortable sharing your gender identification or sexuality? This was a question that's important to raising the issue of those that are from the LGBTQ plus communities in their comfort level of inclusivity. Most people are comfortable with sharing with their friends and family, less so with their coworkers and company leadership, and not so much with their clients, consultants, and contractors. Shifting gears, final chapter, engagement and impact. Negative versus, sorry, positive versus negative engagement and impact perceptions. So those that felt positively or more likely to stay at their firms gained pleasure from working and helping organizations excel and grow. They felt that their firm leaders discussed equity with clients, that their work is impactful to the society at large, and the work positively impacts uh, their family as well as their firm leaders calling out bias. What con contributions are you recognized for at work? Interestingly enough, we see that women, uh, uh, both women, white women and women of color, are recognized for their work ethic, but not so much for their creativity or their project management, technical mentorship, et cetera, skills. And that has a correlation to another slide, which I don't have here tonight, but it's called housekeeping duties. What are the resp primary responsibilities of the men and women at work? Whether it's organizing events or is it technical leadership going out to win work responsibilities? You can do that personal assessment with your firm. Uh, my work has a positive impact in the world. Luckily, both men and women view that their work of the respondents are having a positive impact on the world. That's why we signed up for this crazy job anyway. Whom does your work positively impact? Uh, we'd like to change this from just my clients to be more community-centric, but at least we see that occupants and users are in that high response category. And then these are some of the other uh, statistics from 2016 that I thought were important to bring up, which is when asked all respondents whether or not you negotiate when you receive an uh, offer or a raise that's unsatisfactory, Sadly, less than 40% men and women negotiated for more. And employers might be relieved to say, well, that's good because then I don't have to pay them as much. But actually, that's bad for the profession because we're training people to be risk adverse to negotiations. So it affects not only our proposals, but it affects our ability to um, advocate for our clients as far as change orders and additional services. So it's a lose-lose proposition for our whole profession at large when we can't negotiate. And we also see, I know this is a little hard to read, but 
Uh, the, even though men and women who negotiated, the men are, again, more favored for negotiating, again, because of bias in our society. Women who do negotiate don't fare as well, especially in the later years, as their male counterparts in terms of the salary outcome. We're seeing at least a little bit of the level of the playing field earlier in the respondent pools, but not so much in the later respondent pool. Okay, a lot of information, a lot of depressing information. <laughs> a lot of people are angered and you know, really, really mad, and they say, well, what are we gonna do about this? So this is kind of the energizing moment where I say, all of you have the ability to do something about this. All of you.